Agile for Humans is brought to you by Audible.com. Get one free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, including Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time by Jeff Sutherland, and Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. Visit www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile to enjoy your free audiobook today. Processes and tools dominate today's agile discussions. But we are devoted to the individuals and interactions that make it work. From the beginner to the veteran practitioner, we have something for you. Welcome to Agile for Humans. We are back. It's another episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Joining me tonight... A regular co-host, one of my favorite co-hosts, Mr. Amitai Schleier. Amitai, how are you doing tonight, sir? Good, thank you. Although you said earlier that it looks like I've aged by quite a bit since last night. I know your engagement's tricky sometimes, so I, I, just, I was checking on you, making sure today was an okay day. It is okay, thank you. Excellent. Also joining us tonight, a recent acquaintance of mine, someone that Amitai has known, I think, a little longer. We met... Uh, we've met at a few Agile Coach camps. Mr. Brian Beecham, how are you doing tonight, sir? Doing well. Doing well. So we last saw each other in Washington, D.C., had a great Agile Coach camp conference. It was a very nice thing uh, put on by Mr. Paul Boos. A uh, really neat venue in downtown D.C. and a, really a lot of fun. It's the, the, Those events are fantastic. Um, having so many great people with such a small uh, gathering. Uh, really gives some, some, creates some fantastic uh, atmosphere for some great conversations. Yeah, absolutely. And Brian, so you're with Industrial Logic. We've had a number of your coworkers on with us. Uh, one of them in particular, who we also hung out with in DC, Tim Ottinger. Uh, he's definitely a friend of the show, uh, very supportive of the podcast, been on a number of times. And I think, uh, you know, before we got started here, we we're talking, not too many people know just the, the great impact that Tim has on our community. Yeah, Tim is, uh, you know, a guy I would re- re- relate him to is like Ward Cunningham, the kind of invisibly influence everything that's going on. And you don't realize it. And when you meet them, you're like, wow, that was like the nicest person I've ever met in my entire life. I... There's the bad side of Tim too. No, I'm kidding. I I, I don't. <laughs> I uh, I have so much respect for Tim. Every time I talk to him, I learn new things. Um, he's gonna make fun of me for all the, for saying nice things about him on the show now. No, that's all right. I'll take a little heat from him too for that. He uh, he brings a perspective at least to the topics that we get. You know, it's it's great to. I feel fortunate to get to talk to him, and when we do, the perspectives that he brings forward. Usually something that I have not thought of, it expands the topic. And even today, he was, um, he just did a closing keynote, I'm trying to remember the name of the conference. In Warsaw, Poland, he's at, what is the name of that conference? Agile by Example. Yes, he, so he, he did the closing keynote at Agile by Example. It's 1 a.m., sent me a really nice message. And with using the Tim magic that he has, not realizing that that message that he stayed up late to send, corrected a day for me. It was a rough day. Uh, the message he sent was spot on, uh, just lifted me up. And that's just one of many times where I think the magic at Tim has, uh, has, been, has been present. So great guy, great friend of the show, can't say enough good things. Just want to make sure we congratulate him on an excellent closing keynote at Agile by Example. And uh, we're looking forward to talking to him again soon. Yeah, I think, they, um, I think he was saying that he got invited uh, to two other, other conferences not based on people hearing him speak there. Um, but that's kind of what he does. He kind of just says, yes, how can I help? Um, you know, people don't realize, he talked about the influence and stuff. Like people don't realize from the technical technical side either how he's there. Like if you look in uh, Clean Code, which is like the Bible for a lot of agile software developers, um, you know, the, the first the first uh, mention for co-authors in there is, is Tim, right? Right. Um, Tim's contribution, and it's not the only book. There's lots of books that he's been involved with. His own Agile in a Flash is a very uh, handy guide for for teams. Um, 
Yeah, I, his blogs. I don't know if you've read much of the Agile Otter work. But. Yeah, I'm on there whenever he's posting something new. Always good topics there as well. What I like is that he just takes an aspect that would be easy to be negative about, like management and Agile. Everyone wants to bash the management. And what he, decided, what he decides to do on topics like that is look for the good in management, look for the good in people, look for the motivations and the systems that would cause the behavior that we would initially bash, and then figure out how we can be responsible for a solution. And he takes that approach with a lot of different topics, and I think he makes our profession better by making us think in a more professional way. So really appreciative of that, along with his Take Back Agile. He's on this push right now to take back uh, Agile, you know, from the commercialization, from the, from the scaling, from all these horrible misconceptions about what Agile is and get it back to its core roots. And it's a very authentic topic, and it's one that I think is resonating so much that he is getting these invitations to come and speak on it because it's hitting people at their core. And it's just another one of those, you know, great insights that he's had uh, that I think is just resonating very well throughout the community. Yeah, that definitely. I, I think a lot of people are saying, okay, that word's kind of being misused. Let's find a new word and move on. And, you know, Tim's willing to, as nice a guy as he is, he, he's also willing to, to fight and say, no, but this is, there's some purity in it. There's some, you know, very wholesome parts of Agile that are still valuable today. We need to talk about those still. You know, the, the fighting side of Tim and maybe more of the, the willingness to get in and have difficult conversations is probably the better way to put it than the fighting side. But that's really come out a lot in the no estimate space as well. So Tim's been on a few episodes. We've had panel discussions about no estimates. Uh, he'll get in there and trade some messages back, back and forth from time to time. You know, Brian, we've never had the no estimates discussion. Curious about your thoughts. I know that we've We've crossed paths on Twitter a few times on this topic, but never have really gotten to a deep, engaged uh, discussion on it. Where do you stand? What do you see with that space? And uh, how is the conversation going from your perspective? Well, the way I, I came into the subject was um, for myself. I had been very much into Scrum. And um, then I started, I got to the point where I started to, you know, my background, I'm very much a minimalist, which has attracted me to parts of agile software development. And I started looking at working with the teams and from a minimalistic point of view. And I started saying, well, why am I doing this? Do I need to do this? Do I need to have a like a burn down chart, for example? And I started doing things like saying, well, we're going to run an experiment. We're not going to have a burn down chart. And lo and behold, that had no impact on the team, except for the fact that we'd, we'd gain some time where we weren't talking about our burn down chart and I started to really analyze you know what are the things that are helping us get to our goal and what are the things that are interfering and and more importantly what things add value to our process um, I was also at the same time getting into like lean software development like Mary Poppendick and Tom Tom by the way knows everybody in the world I'm, I'm convinced he is like a connector of everyone you know it's like six degrees from Kevin Bacon I bet you Tom knows Kevin Bacon. <laughs> I'll put money on that. Um, All right. But, we're going to put that on the list of questions for Tom when we, uh, when we manage to get him on the show. Oh, do you know Kevin Bacon? Please do. You got to ask that. Tell him, tell him there's money riding on it. I think I, right. I, I actually owe him, I owe him a dollar or I owe him, a, I think we said a coffee because I bought a CD off him of photos from an Agile conference, and I gave him $10 Canadian instead of American. Oh, no. So it was funny. <laughs> way. But it's a, good, it's a good joke we can have. Of course, he may have, he may have forgotten about it, and I, and I just possibly reminded him. But. <laughs> we'll make sure he listens to this episode, okay. and uh, if, you, if you hear a knock on your door, check out the window before you open it. Oh, I'm more than happy to buy him a coffee. Well worth the conversation. <laughs> anyway, uh, really getting into talking about lean and, and, you know, then we're measuring like waste and anything that doesn't help us, you know, get to our goal is a wasteful activity. And that got me thinking about, um, we were doing planning poker at the time, which, you know, in itself is a, a you know, more efficient version of, of estimating how long work can take. But I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know spring chicken area here i've been in co i've been programming and i've been programming since i was in grade four 
and I've been in, you know, 20 years been doing like professional IT work. And uh, I've never seen the value in getting estimates right. Um, I've, if you guess well, that's good. Okay, how did that help us though in the end? Because it, it, it was so far down the list of important things. Like once I started realizing that I didn't want to go away for six months and build software. And if you're doing that, then you no, know, let's have a conversation about it. But if you if your goal is to discover what the customer needs while you're developing, that changes everything. Now it's about you know what can I learn about the customer? What experiments can I run to get to to qualify that I'm on the right path? And the word I really am focusing on lately is discovery. I want to maximize discovery. And um, when I'm doing estimates, it's it's counter to that. It's like an anchor that I'm dragging behind because estimates are about fixing in the scope of what I'm going to work on. I don't want to change. I don't want to fix my scope at all. I mean, it's part of the Agile Manifesto, right? We, we want to actually, well, the page two that most people don't read, <laughs> the principles, right? We want to allow the customers to change their mind at the last minute because we're building stuff for them. It's for their advantage, um, and that, that helps us too, because the customer is so thankful they keep doing work with us. Um, this idea of fixing everything, like fixing our estimates, it, all it does is help us make it easier for us to plan stuff. But that's not our objective. Our objective isn't to have a proper estimate or to guess right. Um, people say, oh, well, I know everything already. And, I mean, I have no interest personally in working with a company like that. I want to work with a company which says, we're going to try and discover some stuff in this area. Like, that's the exciting thing about industrial logic. We like to run experiments. And we'll put up an experiment. And we have software that we've put out there before. And people said, oh, yeah, that sounds great. We talked to somebody else. That's wonderful. And we build the software. And we sell, like, eight of them. <laughs> And we're like, hey, right. thank goodness we didn't do very much. Right. If we'd gone off for six months, I mean, now I'm starting to tell like a Eric Reese story, right? And Lean Startup. It's like a small version of that. But let's, what's the minimum we can invest to validate our hypothesis that, you know, and the hypothesis has got to be around getting value to the customer. Um, in all of this, if, the, if this is our goal, what we truly want to do, why am I getting all excited about my guess about how long is it going to take? If it's really important, work on it. And then when you're done that, do the next most important thing. Yeah, and I think where a lot of the hangups come in is that the modern corporation and most organizations today are structured in this hierarchical way where estimates feed those levels of authority. Right, So you have someone at the top who's allocating funds, you have people in the middle who are picking the projects, and you have people at these next levels who are the actual doers. And what it comes down to is cost drives decisions. What we're basically saying, and where I think a big disconnect between you know, no estimates advocates and uh, the critics, the, the questioners, the, those that are not on board yet, uh, we're flipping that on its head and saying, let's start with value. Of these five projects, which do you think is most valuable to the company? And you figure that out by you engaging a product owner and having a product owner going out and talking to stakeholders. And you do that kind of work and you figure out where your value is. And then you, then you tell your development teams, this is what we think is valuable. How do we slice this down into its most purest part, into the MVP? How do we get down to that first releasable piece of software that we could find value in? And what does that look like? And you go and do it, and you run that experiment, and you see if the value comes in, and if not, you try the next one. And that, for some reason, is controversial. Well, I think the reason that doesn't get to happen, if I can put a pin in it, uh, the, the bottleneck in that feedback loop starting to flow is the annual budget cycle. It's a dance that we all follow, uh, and it means necessarily that we have to do enough thinking up front to do enough justifying up front 
And then nobody's going to look real carefully for a while after that. And that means that the, the learning that happens from trying things uh, is not incentivized and it's kind of hidden. So even if we, you know, even if we made up a good story about the project we're going to do for six months next year so that we get the money and then we, it was a total lie and we do something else and learn from it, uh, that's not going to go well for us at the next budget cycle necessarily. But even if there is something for us to learn from the experience, we may not get to because the way the whole game is set up. So in my opinion, if, if we are to get to where we can, you know, drip fund something in a way that a customer is directly affected by it and the development team can directly notice whether that was valuable or not, then we have to figure out how to detach ourselves from this annual budget cycle because it, it hides a whole bunch of feedback information and a whole bunch of, uh, of learning. I, I agree with both of you uh, on uh, those points. You know, first of all, having that, that classic hierarchy style, which, you know, we don't know how to, how to have large, flat organizations. I mean, that's an issue. Like, industrial logic, my boss is Josh. That's it. I don't have another boss. Um, now, if anyone needs help or anything, or if anybody asks me to do something, I'll jump into it. That's how we work. We work, we work you know, as best we can towards, uh, you know, our goals that we have set up. Um, it's a very weird environment if you are used to strong hierarchy. We have a certain amount of chaos that goes on. That's one thing Tim talked, of course Tim's talking about it. He's on top of everything. He talked about at, uh, at, you know, at Agile 2015, he ran in one of his sessions and he let it go completely chaotic where he gave people a whole stack of cards of things they had to do. They had to like measure how wide the room was and he gave them some impossible tasks as well so they had to select and it was completely chaotic. But we got a whole bunch of stuff done. And people, this chaos is really uncomfortable to people because like, some of the people who have been opposed to estimates, you have to understand as well, they've devoted portions of their lives to making estimates greater, making us better and more accurate at, at coming up with our estimates. Um, their history, the work that they've been doing, the, the type of companies they work for, estimates has been a very strong part of it. So when you say, I don't need to use estimates, you're actually challenging their history. You just said, hey, by the way, Ryan, that last 20 years of your life, it was all for nothing. That was a waste of time completely. You just wasted all your time. And now I'm thinking that I'd kind of get pretty aggressive at first too. So from a coaching perspective, I think there's a, a huge defensiveness that's going on. And it seems that people are targeting attacks and collaborating on attacks against people to the effort to like you're trying to hush us up or something. But this is discovery. I mean, we are challenging everything. I tell them teams I work with, challenge it, challenge it. The budget cycle is something else we need to challenge. We need to stop working without the, with this. I mean, I, I, I'm from Ottawa in, in Canada and you know, the government has its federal cycle, and we see all kinds of behavior changes when it comes down to the, nearing the end of the budget season. Um, you know, as a contractor for years, I would uh, be getting so many phone calls as soon as the new year hit because they've got to spend the money. Because if they don't spend it, the budget would be reduced. Now, that's a little dirty secret that everybody knows about, but no one would ever say publicly. Oh, it's, it's a fact of life in most major corporations. If you don't spend your budget, you lose it in the next cycle, and then you're limited on the things that you can do. So it, it's so absolutely true. The word that that leads to, and if we went on and spoke for another, I'll just kind of jump us ahead to it. If we spoke for another 20 minutes on it, we'd eventually come up with the word trust. Yes. There are serious trust issues in modern corporations. Um, one of the reasons, not the only reason we do estimates, but one of the reasons we do estimates is because they say, I don't trust this team or I want to help hold them accountable. Um, a word I'm having more and more issues with is uh, commitment. Say, I want this team to commit. I'm like, you know, dude, I, I work for you. I'm pretty committed to this already. You know, like I signed a contract with you. I some people have moved their families halfway around the world and they're being asked to commit. And it's like, 
you don't understand. Like it's, it's kind of abuse of the word. I think um, people want to help the company. People genuinely want to come home and say, I did lots of stuff today. I got stuff done. I helped the company move forward. Nobody wants to come home and say, yeah, I surfed the internet today and, you know, I didn't do anything and I messed up some code so that I can work on it again tomorrow. I'll play around with it some more. I'm not saying those people don't exist, but that is not the majority of people out there. We need to get to, corporations need to transform. There's a lot of great people out there that are working more and more with, with, with management. And there's, I'm, the part that makes me very happy is that there's a lot of companies now that are asking for help. They're asking for help from you know, agile coaches and uh, people doing management transformation and comp- corporate transformations because they're seeing it. They're saying, yeah, we don't want to work this way anymore. Or they've been had very successful agile software teams and they're suddenly running into HR. They're like, well, how do we hire people for these teams? Or they're running into the finance department or they're running into marketing. How do we do agile marketing? Because now this doesn't sync. We have to know in advance what you guys are coming up with so we can set up all our print and get all our stuff ready for our conferences and build our big giant billboards that say feature one point, feature X.3 point is out. And suddenly we have to teach marketing how to be agile. Anyway, it's the, I guess what I'm saying is this, the whole company needs to transform now. We've got, it's been building up and building up and building up. The no estimates is the point. It's the pinprick at, at the front of everything. Yeah, yeah it, it's interesting. I, was, I gave a talk last week at, a, at the local PMI chapter about, um, and it, it's about the scrum master being an impediment to its team or his or her team. And really what it came, came down to in that talk is that a project manager has been split into two roles. It's now part product owner and part scrum master. And the difficulty there is that it's all relationship-based. And if it's relationship-based, it's trust-based. So instead of dealing in tasks and errands and, and schedules, you're brokering trust between groups of people. right? You're brokering trust between stakeholders and the dev team. You're brokering trust between uh, the stakeholders and the product owner, the product owner and the dev team. So you have all of these relationships you're managing, all these relationships you're, you're building, fostering, guiding. You're no longer directing. And that, in the absence of trust, is fear, right? So that fear sets in that I don't have these ETC reports anymore to tell me how many hours are left out of this many predicted hours. I don't have these status reports anymore. I don't have all of these... These mechanisms that gave me this, the illusion that I could control software development, now I have to trust people, and that scares people uh, tremendously, especially those who are entrenched in these ideas and who have always worked this way. And so I was able to reconnect with a great mentor of mine, a, one of my early bosses who taught me so much about being a human being in the workplace. And we were reminiscing about a project where uh, I was brought in, it was in trouble, the schedules were off, the the Microsoft Project Gantt chart was awful, you know, it was, hadn't been updated in months, but they were still using it in meetings. Uh, just every bad practice you could think of, we stripped the project down to the essentials, we started working in iterations, we brought Scrum uh, concepts on uh, month after month, and within three or four sprints, estimates weren't even talked about anymore, because we were talking about working code. And we were talking about the value that that new feature brought to the, the stakeholders' team. And so now we're having these very rich conversations about how we're impacting the organization. We're no longer talking about um, schedule, cost, time to, to a certain extent because we flatline cost. It's just a run cost of the team. And so that, that's just a constant that the, that the stakeholder owned month over month. Instead, we're having rich conversations fueled by trust. They trust us to deliver, we trust them to give feedback, and that loop continues on and on. And it's, it's powered by uh, strong agile coaches or scrum masters who can facilitate, guide, and promote that trust and to keep the fear away, at least in my experience. Uh, that's, that's awesome. I mean, that's, that story is becoming more and more common. You know, the way we're facilitating trust. Um, people have fear of change. Um, if you've worked some way for 20 years, I deal with that with 
software developers all the time. They've, um, you know, done their tests afterward. A lot of them very diligently have written tests, tested all their code, and even have some have automated tests. And um, they uh, talk to them about test-driven development. And they're, you know, they're like, yeah, yeah, I don't get it, though, because I, um, I've done this successfully one way for 20 years. Like, why should I change? There's a lot, huge amount of fear because they're an expert. They're the, you know, they're the go-to person on it. I think for everyone involved, uh, from the programmers who test after or don't, to the uh, decision makers who decide whether to fund for another year or don't, all the way through to marketing, there's, there's a concept that I think kind of unifies what's a roadblock for all of them to this other way of thinking where we rely a lot less on estimating. And that's the idea that the batch size can be a lot smaller than what we're doing right now. I think it's so foreign to a lot of people that we can do a little bit and ship it. And, and if you're listening a little bit to this, more. and yeah. I just want to say to the people who are listening to that podcast, that batch size that you just thought of in your head, it's smaller than that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, for every million dollar project, there's probably a $100,000 proof of concept that could add value and that you could get out quickly. And then if there's a $100,000 proof of concept there, there's probably a $10,000 prototype they would give you immediate feedback on what you're trying to do. And so I could not agree more with that idea that our batch sizes are just ridiculous um, at some, in some projects and that you can always cut it down and even smaller than you initially think. So I, I think that's actually, if you, don't learn, if you don't hear anything else on this episode, it's the batch sizes can always be smaller work, until they can't. <laughs> work in small pieces. I mean, that's, I think it's one of the reasons why Continuous integration, continuous delivery are so popular now as people are starting to appreciate the value of a small batch size. And once I have everything wired up and I have, you know, if I have automated tests running, I can push a piece of code and have it go right into production, you know, within the hour. So, I mean, you know, I could pull up stats and Amazon's doing however many they're doing every three seconds or whatever. Um, outrageous amounts of of code, but this is a new way of programming. This is a new way of working. If you don't use continuous integration, continuous delivery, you're you're a dinosaur. This industry is moving way too quick. You have to be doing working in that way. Here's here's the real reason why you have to work in that way. Your competitor is. Yeah, absolutely, and and it's it's not easy to get there. So it's an investment and it's a long path and it's something that you really should start now. And, you know, and it's again, it gets back to the whole organization changes. So when you start working in small batches, you're putting a ripple through your entire organization. So let's say that a development team decides to work in two-week sprints or iterations, depending on if you're doing Scrum or some other agile flavor. Um, you can no longer do manual testing. It's too slow. Your testing team, it's too slow. So now you have to invest in an automated testing harness and automated tests and put all of that infrastructure in place, which also requires continuous integration, continuous delivery. You probably want unit testing on top of there because that's going to be your most effective way to do uh, some of the automated testing. And all of a sudden you have this new investment in skills, tools, uh, techniques uh, that affects more than just your, your development team. Now you have infrastructure that's got to be able to provision a machine within an hour of being asked or else it's too slow. They've got to be able to roll out all these different services and tools. So now you've hit these groups. Now all of a sudden when you're delivering in a, in a two-week sprint, the business has to be able to take a look at or your business partner has to be able to look at this new software and, and test it out and take a look and do their acceptance testing and, and see what that software, hopefully they're doing that as they go, but they have to be able to work at that cadence as well. They have to be able to accept those, those changes and to get those changes communicated out to the larger organization, right? So you have all these other interdependencies. When one team decides to go fast, the slowest one is the bottleneck. They have to improve and, and then the next one's the bottleneck and so on and so forth. It's a massive change. This is a grenade on most modern corporations, but it has to be done, as Brian was saying, or else you are the dinosaur. Well, the, I think some people don't appreciate it. They're like, well, why should I make my batch size smaller? Like, what, what's the point? And it gets down to getting feedback. If we can deliver something quickly, we can get the feedback 
and make a decision based on it doesn't mean we're going to do exactly what the customer said. We may have a big target and a longer vision in mind. It's not about just listening to what they say. It's about hearing what they say and then making a decision based on that. But without that information coming back, we have no idea what's going on. And we want to get it as soon as possible because, you know, you talked about beforehand, you said for, you know, the million dollar idea, I got a $10,000 prototype or $100,000 program and I got $10,000 prototype and, and we keep breaking it down. And you hear about these lean startup people who are putting a website up with two two um, links on them. Or putting a link on there saying, hey, we've got this cool new service. Click here to sign up and be among the first people. And they right. get they get no action on it for like two weeks. They're like, oh, well, this stinks. Good thing we didn't go spend a million dollars. <laughs> um, but the learning is fantastic. On the other side of the coin, they put it on and on the first day, they get 30,000 hits. Well, now I've got simple justification for going and, and starting this project oh you got to build it now you've got thirty thousand potential customers got to do it no brainer yeah so, it's, so we had it, uh we had arlo on a couple episodes ago and he said uh an agile in 10 words a couple years ago that has been <laughs> seared into my brain because i loved it when i saw it and it kind of ties together what we're saying and maybe leads to our next topic and that's work tiny prove it get done learn constantly, work together. And then he adds a few more words, and those words are, note, the tech is first. And that's why I think this leads to our next topic, because strongly implied there is that you need the ability to refactor smoothly in order for your, your batch sizes to be small, in order to be able to work in this way, that has to be possible. So we were also interested in hearing about human refactoring. Can you tell uh, us more about what that is? Yeah, so this is a topic that Brian did a session on at Agile Coach Camp 2015 out in D.C. I caught the latter end of it. I picked his brain for as long as he would let me, and then we both had to get on to different sessions. But I wanted to circle back and talk about this because it's a fascinating topic. We're both big, I think the three of us are big Tim Ferriss fans. I know that this is a, a huge topic in his four-hour body uh, book where he's he's always running experience. I'm expecting him to accidentally do something permanent to himself one day, just given all the different types of drugs and concoctions and experiments that he runs <laughs> on himself as the human guinea pig. But so far, so good. He, he's alive and well, which we're all happy about. Well, but, uh, you know, Brian, you've got some thoughts here that, that I, I just found absolutely fascinating and would love for you to share with the audience. Yeah, Tim is a uh, yeah, very inspiring uh, work for our body. I, I recommend it to anyone who, um, you know, who who cares about self-improvement. And, you know, I just want to preface all of this. Um, I, I'm, I'm doing a keynote in, uh, in, in Germany at Agile Testing Days on human refactoring. And uh, the, one of the titles I talk under is the, the human refactor experiment. And um, just I want to get the word experiment in there because it's so important. But I recently have just changed a lot of my approach. I'm changing the whole front end of it because... As I work more and more, and this is probably an influence from Agile Coaching, I just want everyone to know, and I'll probably get poked at fun by Tim for saying this as well, but everyone's perfect right the way they are. Right the way they are right now, no matter how much you weigh, no matter your condition, your life has brought you to that point. There's nothing wrong with it. And I want everyone to just let go of any guilt or judgment they have for themselves. We put so much judgment on, oh, you shouldn't eat that, you shouldn't have had the fries, you should have had this instead, or you should have walked instead of driving. And, and that stress is the most dangerous thing of all. That's like a toxin, a toxic poison that we're putting into our systems uh, every day. And I, I want everyone to know that they have a perfect, beautiful being inside of them. And what I want to talk about human refactoring is that if you look at yourself and you say, I'm not just surviving, I want to thrive, I want to be more than just this. I, and, and you're doing it for you. This isn't for somebody else for to impress somebody or to, um, you know, uh, the, it has to be an intrinsic motivation. I've worked with people, so I have a people that I work with as a, and I say I'm a human refactor guide and 
I occasionally will talk with them and uh, just over the phone sometimes, or we'll do, you know, Google Hangout or Skype and um, just catch up on where they are, where their goals are. And, and just like you're a fitness coach might work with them. I'll work with the people to um, help keep them on the path. Um, so I know I'm getting a little meta- metaphysical here, but I've really gone from looking at it from the pure physical side, kind of where Tim Ferriss has been. And, um, you know, my latest hacks are getting into meditation and I'm getting into like, um, you know, fixing, like looking at yourself emotionally and saying, Hey, can I hack that? Not even hack. Can I fix that? Can I experiment with it? Am I happy with where it is? And in a non-judging way, put a plan out and say, where would I like to be? You know, and I talked to so many people who are saying, I'm dissatisfied with my, let's take work, for example. You know, I don't like my job. I'm like, well, what do you picture yourself doing? And like, let's build a path to get there, a constructive path to do it. And, you know, that's, to me, human refactoring has expanded to include all that as well. Sorry, there was a bigger preface than I intended, but um. no, it, it's good, and it, and it's a fun topic. It's one that I think a lot of you guys at, in industrial logic, you guys have this focus on more than just the technology, and which is it's something that I find fascinating about your company um, and the people that that Josh decides to hire. You know, if you look at Woody Zool, he he has this intrinsic um, love and care for people and teams, and if you look at Arlo Belshi, he is, um, man, he's, he's very similar. He's all about emotional intelligence and are we being intelligent in the way that we make decisions and are we letting emotions rule and are we making objective uh, decisions without the cognitive bias? And if you look at Tim Oninger, it's all about the brain chemistry and the, how the brain works and, and are we doing things that sabotage or benefit ourselves? And now with you, Brian, it's, um, it's this discussion about being comfortable with where you're at and being okay with that and then making intentional plans outside of the tech, you know, because these things that if we can get these other things right, the technology and, and the, the outcomes become better. And so it's, it's a very, I think it's a noble focus that you guys foster. So I want to make sure to call that out too. Um, I had the biggest surprise, um, you know, with the uh, Jeepa Hill and I always knew how much, he, how how savvy he was in the world of coding and talking technical with him and and I mean he's got a he's got a interesting technique sometimes in working with companies where he'll go in and if there's like um a lot of cowboy coders and a lot of um you know if there's some senior developers that are driving decisions instead of team decisions he'll go at them one on one and code with them. He'll say, "Give me your hardest piece of code," and and he'll do it. And he'll he'll walk in there and he'll fix it, which of course wins them over right away. And they're like, "I want to learn more." So from this guy, I learned that his most important thing, the same way he said, "I'm going to mess up the quote a little bit," but he said, "The more I learn about programming, the more I realize it's about the people and not about the code." And I was like shocked I, I i got them all wrong but it's like you say you go through our company as they get to know everybody in it um everyone talks about the people it's the people that make change if the people aren't aligned when they come into work how are they supposed to do great work how are we supposed to do inspirational work that changes the world makes the world a better place if we're completely mixed up and we're angry and we got you know people are like trying to deal with the crazy schedules and I don't know, driving across town or there's a million reasons. And we all have our own that we can think of. I'm sure everyone's got five that pop into their head. How can we do fantastic work when this is weighing on us? We're not. And you know, uh, a line is the best word I have. We get kind of a sort of mental, physical and spiritual um, alignment and when these three things are aligned within us, then we can do amazing things. That's when you have like 
a guy like Tim doing a keynote and people are like, holy smokes, that was amazing. And they get their heads blown, right? That was for you podcast people at home. I'm making the gesture of my universal gesture of my head blowing up. Uh, <laughs> that's good. That's good uh, podcasting right there, Brian. Uh, thanks. Work. Thank you. <laughs> I'm really happy you mentioned G. Paw Hill. Uh, he's someone that I've looked up to for a long time. And uh, I think the common thread here with uh, all the other folks you mentioned, Ryan, and, and Brian, your story and mine for sure, is that most of us who come to this place of coaching or perhaps uh, management with a technical focus, we're coming from uh, a starting point on this journey of being programmers or being technically minded and gradually realizing that our effectiveness is not limited by how well we program. It's limited by something else. And the reason that, that the mention of GPAW particularly warms my heart is that he's a person who brings his whole self to work and, and to not work and all the time. He's himself no matter where he is. And that's something that I've always aspired to. And to see it uh, at that level of skill and that level of authenticity has been personally inspiring to me. So I just want to call out, as long as we're having appreciation for Tim, let's have appreciation for GPA yeah. as well. Uh, you it's, mentioned uh, that's the right word, authentic. I've never met anyone as authentic as GPA. His Twitter feed is a must follow. I, I enjoy it when he, so I've never met uh, G. Paw Hill, and I actually started following him because uh, Amitai, I think, recommended him at, at one point, or he was saying, hey, he's on one of these, he goes on these streams of consciousness oh, yeah. that, uh, that you just follow and you're like, God, my brain is blowing up here. He he's was, just, he's, he was talking about Louis Armstrong yesterday. Yeah. It was awesome. I had to, I started I read one of them tweets and I'm like, what is he going on about? And I <laughs> I had to back up and then I started reading the whole group of them. And the next thing you know, I'm like following the links and I'm like reading up on stuff and I'm I'm like, how did he do that? He just you know, he just inspired uh ideas and concepts and yeah, it, it's he's a pretty trippy guy. I can't explain what it's like to work at Industrial Logic. It's uh being around these guys um, is uh, it's pretty intense. Um, and we have our intense moments too, right? As you can imagine, you put a lot of strong personalities together. We get, um, we get good, strong debates and arguments, but we come through it and we learn from each other and we actually listen. And um, we get really direct sometimes. Uh, which you got to suck up, suck it up a little bit and go, wait a sec, this person is not, their intention is not to hurt my feelings. Their intention is to exchange information and to challenge a point. And once you get to that state of mind, things change dramatically. We have such a strong level of comfort. There's less fear. Like, you know, it's not a personal attack. It's, a, it's an idea attack. And that's a little different. And... Uh, are, we're capable of a lot because of that. It sounds like it's it's a high level of trust that um, once you guys get through a topic, a decision's made, that uh, words and things are not going to be used against you later, that you can actually have an authentic conversation that's idea-driven. And I think that's, you know, to, to hit on some of our other topics from tonight, even in the no estimate space, I don't feel like that's a safe conversation, right? Oh. There's a there's many talented people on the no estimates tag. Woody Zool, Neil Killig, Vasco Duarte, three very intelligent people who I would talk with every day. There's critics out there that I also like and respect. Uh, Gene Hudson is one of them. He does a very nice job of, of um, putting up some, some arguments that you have to listen to. Dan Greening has been on the podcast and he had some very legitimate architecture concerns that uh, he related back to the no estimates discussion. Very good conversations. There's other characters <laughs> in, in that debate that I don't feel safe making a comment to because it will be used over and over against me if, I, if it's not a well thought out or if it's not a complete statement. With you guys, we can have a discussion. We can say something half-baked. We can build on it. And at the end of it, we can all be proud that we all formulated an idea. And that's a safe environment. On that hashtag... That does not exist. That is a, <laughs> That's a, a, half, a half thought is used against you six months later when the, when the group has moved on to something else. And I think that holds back, even in organizations, 
if it's not safe to collaboratively discuss something, if it's not safe to be wrong, the conversation is stifled. Well, that's our whole thing. I mean, Josh goes on about Josh Karowski, goes our our president and founder, and uh, he, he talks about engineering. Um, engineering is a Japanese word for safety and engineering put together. Um, but safety is a critical, critical aspect. I mean, that's why we want to have tests on things. It's not safe for the customer to not have tests. It's not safe for us. It's we start looking at everything from um, the safety angle. Our, our actual official titles at the company are, are engineers. Yep. We're engineers um, because we want to go in and create that safety. Uh, absolutely. You're, you're right on the mark. I mean, right now we can have a, a strong debate because I'm willing to be wrong. I know yep. that you two are both very intelligent guys, although one of you is on a near carnivore diet. <laughs> and How do you think I got to be so smart? Oh, <laughs> nice comeback. That's oh, well done. Well played. That's the meat talking. Yeah. That's the meat talking. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a tie likes Brian, to kill things. You, you didn't see what happened the other night when uh, we uh, we had to handle some. This is a side talk. Sorry, we had to handle some uh, these wonderful tandoori uh, chicken wings. And Ooh. they just kept on coming, and you know it would it would have been rude for us to stop eating. I suppose. Well, and they were produced in a small batch size, so we were able to keep up with them. That's right. Very, it, so constant and continuous and sustainable throughput, huh? It was, you know. It was. It was the size of how much the barbecue could hold. But that was a perfect batch size. You know, a, a smaller batch size would have been better because then they would have always been hot. But Well, it worked out okay for me. I was able to continuously integrate a lot of chicken. So <laughs> it worked out okay. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I just don't want to hear about the, the delivery later on. Mm. But I, I think where, you're, where you were going, Brian, and I think it's an important point, is that the three of us are... Look, we're all we're all bright guys. We all respect each other, and we're all willing to be wrong. And I've been wrong countless times on this podcast, where Amitai has had to pick up the pieces of my foolish thought at po- at certain points, or Tim. And the difference is, we all do it with grace, right? So we all extend that respect and that grace, and we say, "Well, I don't necessarily gr- agree with this part of your comment, but let's take this other segment and move it forward." And that's the difference between a debate and a collaboration. Well, it's a, right? sort of a yes and mentality instead of a, yep. let me find out what your mistake is and point it at you. Well, one thing is, too, that um, a lot of people, um, they formulate ideas by talking. They need to hear the idea come out. So they need the words. Not everyone works this way. The people who don't work that way get quite frustrated by those of us who do. Um, I need to blah, 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 have a big blabbing open conversation about stuff. And the idea flows that way. And I kind of get into a free flowing mode. And I mean, I'll talk out loud at a whiteboard sometimes. I just need to get it out. I need to hear what I'm thinking. I can't just think about it. I've got some colleagues who are uh, not colleagues now, but uh, that I've worked with in the past who are brilliant. And they're very much sort of quiet thinkers. They'll like let this idea sit and formulate it in their head, and they'll keep working it over, and then eventually it'll be good enough for the for for daylight, and they'll bring out their idea at the ninety five percent mark. And I'm I'm gonna throw my idea out there at the five percent mark, like I want to ship it now. <laughs> Here's my idea. What do you think? You're like, oh, that's stupid. I'm like, oh, okay. What do you think is stupid? Well, what about this? I'm like, ooh, I hadn't thought of that. And then what about this? And we go back and forth. For me. It's one reason I love working with Agile is I love collaborating and I love working with people and I love the teamwork and and I really honestly deep down inside feel that to make the best thing, I want to get all of us together, that I myself cannot produce the best result alone. Uh, now, another awesome guy, Llewellyn Falco, has this beautiful graph about this where he shows a single developer working on a problem. And uh, for those of you at home, I'm bringing my finger up and down in the air, making a sort of valley and mountain graph. He makes this graph of like the high points being the best you could do, the valleys being, you know, well, it was the best you could do, but it wasn't very good. And the then he, he says, well, we'll let's look at pair programming. And you overlay pair programming on top of that. Well, the 
if you knew more than the other guy or girl, then you still have the highest point. But the valley suddenly come up. And then he said, well, let's take a look at mob programming now. And now we get to use everybody's best point. So the software produced is now the best it could be. Not the best you could make or the best we could make, but the best our whole team could make. So if we truly care about the value of the customer, giving value to the customer, we should be using mob programming. So there's actually, we had uh, Dan Greening on a recent episode uh, and Zach Boniker and I talked to him. He actually gave us a heads up at the Hawaii International Conference on System Sciences. So this is a um, a systems conference that's coming up, uh, I believe, in January of next year. There is a paper that's been submitted uh, that actually puts real data behind the idea that I believe it was just pair programming, but uh, that pair programming does increase the effectiveness of people. Now, he couldn't give too much more uh, information due to the paper not being released yet, but was saying that there is some exciting data coming out in this space that totally supports uh, the the flowing graph that you just uh, articulated with your fingers. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think there are some discoveries coming out and some real data that we can start using with organizations and management and teams to show that, yes, this is a legitimate practice. And if pair programming is good, Mob programming has to be great, right? I, when I saw um, Woody talk about it, uh, I think it was in Nashville years ago, I said um, to myself, I said, self, no. I said that in a few years, everyone will work this way. I was just completely, to me, it was, again, the gesture of my mind being blown. It was a mind-blowing event for me. And I said, this is, this is it. This is the way we should work. Because, again, my focus is on delivery of stuff, not on, you know, pumping out lines of code. Oh, here's another Tim Montinger story because there's just so many of them. Um, Tim has this great story that he tells in classes and he says, he says, hey, uh, Ryan and I were, were working on some code yesterday. And, uh, you know, uh, I, you know I, I came back to Ottawa and Ryan called me in a panic this morning and he said, our source control went down and we, we lost everything. And I went, oh, that's okay, though. You emailed me all the changes that you were going to put in that were, that were going to go into the system. Uh, I'll give them back to you. I'll email it back to you and uh, or go into your sent items. Usually it's a printout here or a fax, but I'm trying to modernize the story a little bit. Um, <laughs> you say, here's the code that you put into the source control system. How long would it take for you to type? And it's like, well, um, you know, people guess around the, they go around the classroom, people guessing, and everyone's kind of guessing between like 20 and 40 minutes. And so like 30 minute average, I'm like, well, over the course of the day, you did six hours of work, but you only have like 30 minutes of results, 30 minutes of quality code that you could type in. What were you doing for the rest of the time? Uh Oh, <laughs> oh you suddenly go, oh, well. I was thinking it's it's not about hands on keyboards. It's about right. minds on problem. And suddenly we realize that the bottleneck is not the keyboard. The bottleneck is the conceptual idea and solving it. So mobbing and you look at it, he does that. He's talking about pairing, but mobbing is just to the whole other degree. Let's get everyone working on that problem to get the right thing through. You know, it's, and it's, let's it's, and let's teach everyone how to do it the right way, which is the other important factor. So oh. it's that that lean concept of what is it amplifying learning? Yes. Oh, I, I need to throw a little caveat in here cuz people are going to like, you know, I'll, I'll hear about it for the next 6 months that <laughs> typing isn't important. I want to express why so many agile coaches are having you, they're unplugging your mouse and making you use keyboard shortcuts. It's uh -huh. not because we want you to go faster. It's because we want you to stay on target. Just imagine the, the computer inside Luke Skywalker's X-Wing fighter. Stay on target, stay on target. You know, it's actually the, the leader. But um, now I'm going to get blasted by some Star Wars guys for messing that up. 
It was actually Rogue was Star Leader. Trek. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> okay, that was the best Star Trek. Right, they did. <laughs> that, was, that was beautiful. Hey, it's all J.J. Abrams now, so who cares, right? I love it. I want many, many, many <laughs> movies. The whole point is that we want you to stay focused on the problem. And when you have to reach over and grab the mouse and go up and click something, you're spending time away from the problem. Right. So there's something with um, typing with your hands. They just The mouse is, is still not a natural flowing thing. It's this extra item. Um, when we're on the keyboard, we can be much more immersively focused. And again, at the same time, you don't even know the need to know the, shortcut, the keyboard shortcuts as much. It will speed up the flow of things. But is, again, ask yourself the real question. Is that the bottleneck? Unless you're using Vim, and then you have to know the keyboard shortcuts. Oh, my God. That's right. Let's not get into that. I love Vim. But so there's something also self-reinforcing <laughs> about uh, the feeling like you can manipulate the code the way that you're thinking of uh, in a direct way so that it doesn't feel like there's a barrier between having the idea and trying it. Because really we want to get to where it's really easy to try something, including putting it back when we're done afterward. It's just another aspect of safety. Like, is, is the risk from getting this idea out of my head or is it safe for me to try that? And part of that is I'm comfortable with the keyboard. I'm comfortable transcribing that quickly and mechanically with the machine that I have. That's a great point. I mean... You know, how quickly can we back out? Like, a lot of people don't think about that. They'll keep digging the hole, and they're like, oh, I'm in a hole, I'll keep digging. Oh, it's a deeper hole, I'll keep digging. It's like, you've got to know how to, like, do a git reset, or you know how to jump out and go, oh, oh, oh I'm bailing on this, and throw it away. Throw this it is away. what we were talking about earlier, with the batch size is even smaller than you're thinking. It's as small as, you know, a one-line git commit, just so you have a place to go back to. Oh, who cares? I'll just throw this away. Oh, we screwed up. No problem. It's easy to back out. I, you know, Josh has a term, graceful retreat. We might start down a, uh, a larger re refactoring and we'll go, uh-oh, like this isn't working. But you've got to be in a situation that you can easily bail on it. Don't waste time trying to find your way back. It's a computer. You just go back to your save point. It's like loading in a save game and continue on. Uh, something I've wondered, because... Because Josh is very active on certain blogs, and I, he's actually answered some of my blogs and left comments, and he's very interactive at times. Is he still programming with you guys? Oh, yeah, today. Today, today awesome. he wrote code today. Um, it's awesome. Like, oh, oh, yeah, Josh, it, he's an uh, interesting guy to work with because he, uh, you know, obviously a very brilliant guy, but... Um, the most one of the most amazing things is his memory. He just remembers so much information at once. When he called me up to come and work at Industrial Logic, he was like, "Yeah, I remember when we met in San Francisco, and it had been like three years ago." And he he basically recited half our conversation. Wow! And I was like, "What?" I yeah, I was. It was pretty cool. Um, the he loves the coding. I mean, for him, he always like part of it. He always wants us to, after, for example, if you're teaching a, one of our courses, the next week back, make an improvement. Doesn't matter how small it is. You got to go and do something to the code. You know, if you came across a word, maybe maybe some text was kind of awkward. You know, the students may have remarked that, oh, what do you mean by this? If they asked a question about it, go in and fix it. Really, really practice continuous improvement. Yeah, I I'll pull that if you want. I was just curious about if he's still actually in the code and very very much so in the code. Cool. I don't think he'd have any problem me saying that at all. Uh, yeah, I just always have been impressed with him as far as his engagement with the community, and then to find out that he's still uh, writing code as well as running you know such a a, a wildly successful. Uh, company like industrial logic it, it's just uh, it's really neat to hear so we'll have to uh we'll have to leverage all of our industrial logic friends and try to get them on the show amitai sounds like it sounds like so, well, sounds like a lot of us have been on yeah we're uh, we're trying to collect the whole set you, so we're almost there yeah have you got bill wake yet not yet oh you or, have to talk to bill wake bill 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 wake is another uh unknown wonder of the agile world he's just yep. Bill will blow your mind. I was like working with someone and they're like, we're talking about user stories. 
and they were talking about uh, about Invest, right, for user mm-hmm. stories. And they're like, yeah, that's a really cool thing I use. It's investing. I'm like, oh, you mean that Bill Wake came up with, my colleague? And they're like, oh, he came up with that? It's People don't know, like, the impact of people like Bill and Tim on the community. And, and they're not just, you know, new faces. They've been around since the beginning. I mean, uh, industrial logic is turning 20 next year. Wow. 20. Well. And Brian, don't sell yourself short, uh, and especially in the place or in the space of test-driven development and teaching uh, through Legos, especially, uh, you've had quite a wide impact on the community as well. And so I want to make sure that you're putting yourself in that group. Uh, you don't get to the industrial logic status by not having an impact. And the things that you do in the community, especially uh, taking these very advanced concepts and bringing them down to where... Um, they're more digestible to a wider audience is very important too. So it's, it's really the great work that you guys do there. And uh, you're certainly a huge part of that along with Woody Zool, Bill Wake, um, Arlo Belshi, Tim Oninger. I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody that's been on the show as well, but uh, it's great work you guys do and can't thank you enough for joining us tonight. And as I look at the clock, we've hit our time box. So we want to make sure we're respectful of your time, but Brian, this hour flew by. And so I, I hope we can talk into doing this again because it was uh, a tremendous amount of fun. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk again. I mean, we didn't we kind of skimmed over human refactoring. Maybe we can deep dive into that sometime. I think there's a lot of concepts there that people, I know people ask me a lot of questions about um, how to get started on, on changing their lives. So I think we've previewed it. And so we'll uh, we'll try to do a follow up discussion, and maybe in the next few weeks here, where we really dig into it, because it's like I said, I got to see the tail end of it. You very graciously uh, ran through the the highlights for me quickly. Fascinating topic. It's one that I'm interested in because uh, I want to live to uh, 200 as well. <laughs> oh, now we got them with the hook. So that's for next time. But uh, as we wrap up, Brian, at this point, uh, we like to have our guests any kind of plugs, any kind of things that you want to promote, uh, anything coming up that people should know about. And uh, we'll put, of course, we'll put the links in the show notes so that people can check these things out. But what have you got going on? What would you like to plug or, or promote to the audience? Um, I'm going to be speaking in Brazil, Agile Brazil, uh, just near Recife um, in October. I'm doing test driven development with Lego. And this will now be the fourth continent that I have done TDD with Lego on. Nice. Um, which, by the way, I, is, is, it's my gift to the world. So if you would like to teach TDD with Lego, um, all I ask you to do is to, um, is to uh, give me a reference to it. Just say, hey, I saw this cool thing that Brian did. There's slides online right now, but there's um, Mike Buller, who I've done it a lot of times with, has put some uh, instructions up on his website. Um, I can send you the link for that later to put up for people. Great. And uh, the big thing is I'm in Germany. Um, one of the keynotes at um, Agile Testing Days talking about human refactoring. Congratulations on that keynote. That is a, uh, it's a great conference. It's not going to make it this year, but uh, I sh- I'm sure you're going to knock it out. I, I got to do a real shout out to that conference. Um, last year was my first year, and I was completely blown away by the excellence of it and the format of it. The size and the way they format, you know, they don't just have two keynotes. They have, they have quite a few keynotes. There's nine or 12 keynotes. And the keynotes uh, intersperse regular kind of sessions. The end result is a lot of interaction between the people. So their setup maximizes interaction, uh, interaction between people. And you get a ton of content. Um, it's, it's such a well-designed conference. Uh, to me, it's, it's, awesome. it's the, I think it's the best design conference in the world right now. Oh, that's great. Amitai, anything else you'd like to promote? Anything the listeners should know about from you? Well, let me, I'll do one for you. Uh, Amitai is the host of Agile in Three Minutes. Excellent uh, podcast. It's a weekly podcast where it's three minutes of Agile poetry, as I like to call it. He takes a topic, it takes a word, and he, he gives you three minutes of insights that leaves your mind blown for the rest of the day. Uh, just great thoughts, and it's like, boom, it's good stuff. Uh, it's my, it's one of my favorite podcasts. I can't say it's my totally favorite podcast because I 
produce this podcast, but it is it is a close number two. It is one that I look forward to each week, and uh, every once in a while we share an, an episode on here. Maybe next uh, next time we record, I'm a tie. We'll get another one in uh, in the feed so that the audience can check it out. I listen to it. Uh, he's gotten beautiful comments from uh, quite a few people on it. I strongly encourage people to uh, check it out. It's now on iTunes. Welcome to the 21st century, Amitai. And so that uh, that should also help uh, people find it. Anything else though, that you would like to plug or promote? Well, thank you as always for the kind words and encouragement. Uh, I, I, I love to know that it's appreciated. Feedback is welcome from anyone, anytime, including on iTunes, now that that's available. Uh, in particular, I would point you, given the topic for today, uh, at the episode number 11 of Agile in Three Minutes, which is called SAFE. And my other plug is that you should follow G. Paul Hill on Twitter. Absolutely. Well, why aren't then, you following G. Paul Hill on Twitter already? Because you're missing out. Even if you hate software, follow G. Paul Hill. Even if you hate Agile. No, maybe especially if you hate Agile. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, he's one that I have a, a notify on, so my phone will actually ping me when he puts something out. So I like keeping tabs on what he's doing. Because like you said, it just goes in these interesting directions, and then you're all of a sudden you're learning about something you never thought you'd be learning about that day, but uh, always good stuff. For me, I have one plug. I'm speaking at CDEC this year, uh, CDEC 2015 up in Winnipeg, Canada. So, great, Brian, I'll be up. Great conference. I've, I, the only reason I'm not there is that's the same time as Agile Testing Days. Yep. Uh, Those are so, great people. It's a bummer I'm going to miss you, but, uh, yeah, I've been working with or bouncing messages back and forth uh, intermittently with Steve. Uh, just a, a, seems like just so well-organized, very speaker-friendly uh, looking forward to the barbecue oh. one of the nights. I hear he he cooks up some mean barbecue. Oh, just 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 so people so. listening understand what the, the, how this is. Steve does it at his house. Like right. you know, two years ago we had a guitar go. I was playing guitar in his backyard, and he um, I I only said he asked me if I'd come out and speak at the conference, and I said you got to give me steak. He's like okay, it's <laughs> like done. Yeah, no. So I'm really looking forward to it. I hear it's. Uh, an excellently done con or conference. Uh, so looking forward to that. So if you're going to be at CDEC, uh, find me, uh, reach out, please say hello. Uh, definitely want to uh, engage and interact with as many people up in Canada as possible. It'll be my, f- it'll be my first trip into Canada. So I'm uh, definitely looking forward to now everyone's saying, why would you make your first trip in November? Well, I didn't schedule the conference, so I'm, I'm dressing warm and uh, I'm going to I'm going to enjoy it. I, I think it's going to be a great event. Otherwise, okay, so uh, one thing you have to do is you have to go to the corner of Portage and Maine. OK. What's at the corner of Portage and Maine? That we will continue the conversation after you've been there. All right. I will check it out, and Brian will come back, and we'll have a conversation about what he walked me into. Yeah. Oh, no. People <laughs> will go with you. Okay. Yeah. I We will organize a trip. So I'm excited about that. I get to do the help, uh, the Scrum Master is the impediment talk up there about how we've split the project manager into two and caused havoc and chaos for all of these people and how to get them realigned and, and back in uh, – into working order. So it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of human engineering. It's uh, a lot of talk on trust and, and working in the spaces between the roles and the the ceremonies and the artifacts of Scrum. So if you can make it, please do reach out. Looking forward to it. Otherwise, I just really appreciate that everyone's here. You know, I, I check the feeds every once in a while and I'm just amazed at the the numbers and you know, we went screaming past 10,000 downloads for such a young podcast. It's just humbling the numbers keep going up, so I just really appreciate all of you listeners and the great feedback. I'm a tie. We've been talking lately. We're getting all these wonderful comments on Twitter and uh, reviews on on iTunes, and feedback's been tremendous. Truly humbling, you know, between I'm a tie and myself and Zach as kind of the core host, and people like Brian and Woody Zool and Tim Ottinger uh, and Arlo Belshi and all these other great guests. Uh, you know, George Dinwiddie, Don Gray, Esther Derby. We've just been blessed with this roster of amazing people who are so gracious with their time, and it's just all coming together in this great way um, and just so grateful for that. So we'll leave you guys with that thought. Again, Brian, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Amitai, always, always great to see you, uh, even if you are looking a little older today. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey. <laughs> but uh, that's it for this episode of Agile for Humans. Thank you for listening, everyone, and have a great night. 
Thanks for listening to Agile for Humans. Let's keep the conversation going. Drop us a question on Twitter at Agile for Humans or visit agileforhumans.com. <laughs>